Coming up, Instagram gate heats up and fizzles out and then gets an update all within the course of an hour. Plus, Facebook nearby is taking on Foursquare and Yelp. Watch out, guys. Twitter's getting into the TV ratings business and keep on top of rebuttals online. All that and more next on The Social Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Bandwidth for the Social Hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is The Social Hour with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur. Episode 91, recorded Thursday, December 20th, 2012. This episode of The Social Hour is brought to you by Social Media Solutions from SAP. If you're a social media manager at a large enterprise, gain insight and engage in social media in a systematic way with Social Media Solutions from SAP. Learn more at sap.com slash twit. And by Ford, featuring Bliss, the blind spot information system with cross-traffic alert and active park assist. Check out these available features on the 2013 Ford Fusion and 2013 Ford Taurus and learn more at Ford.com slash technology. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Social Hour from Twit World Headquarters in Petaluma, California. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur from South Florida. I'm mixing it up a little bit, Sarah. I've uh, come down to South Florida for a few weeks, so I'll be doing the show from here for the next couple of weeks. And uh, so far, so good. Life is good here. I know that it is because I was actually in the exact same neighborhood just a couple weeks ago for for the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday. Um, um, uh, MG and I were down in Florida, and you and I were talking about, you said, well, what part of Florida? And it turns out it's right next to where your family has a place. Yeah, it's super close. I mean, just a few miles up the road. So uh, it's a great area. You know, uh, the beaches are beautiful. I don't really do that much except for I do some work and then go to the beach and then come back and do some work. And pretty much uh, that's it for my time down here. And as much as I love Toronto and winter, it's a nice change to get down here into some really beautiful weather. So uh, I cannot complain at all. And it's a, like I said, it's a nice change. Well, you know, not doing a whole lot, you're in good company because there are so many retirees in Florida. Yes. You just have, you have easy living, you've got early dinners. I love it. You know, go to bed early. Yeah. Watch a little Jeopardy. Wonderful. Ah, it sounds so good. (laughs) It is pretty it's good. I can't complain at all. So, uh, of course, I've been following along with everything that's been happening in social media. And uh, the biggest thing that's happened over the past little while is uh, what you have in the uh, rundown here is Instagram gate. Yeah. So much happening with Instagram. So many people angry and going back and forth. If they're going to quit, they're not going to quit. It just never ends. Yeah, it's really true. I mean, and, and, and we're pre-recording this show uh, a little bit ahead of time. Uh, because the Twit Studio is actually going to be going to be dark, meaning we're not actually going to be shooting shows uh, for some of the Christmas holiday to give uh, the staff, you know, a break. So, what we're talking about with Instagram, of course, is them changing their terms of service and really freaking some people out about whether or not us users, uh, as users of the service, own our own photos. Now, things may change if you're not watching the show live by the time the show airs, but assuming that they don't, what's happened thus far? is that Instagram changed their terms of service. I, I, I noticed it. Um, I, had, I was looking at my feed, and right there at the top, there was sort of a little privacy policy thing, and I didn't actually read it at the time. Amber, I don't know if you saw that and, and, and read it as well, but I figured, uh, you know, I'd get to that later. I don't know, some, you know, legal stuff. Well, there are plenty of people who did read it and got really freaked out about some of, some of the wording um, of, uh, of, of the new terms of service that, that said things like, um, we have the, you know, the right to share your photo or advertisers have the right to, you know, pay money to use your photo and, and, and you wouldn't be monetarily compensated. And, and, and it, was, it, was, it was confusing for a lot of people. And I think a lot of people jumped to conclusions and said, hold everything. They're going to sell my photos, um, you know, the photos of my son or, you know, or, or, or my cat or, or, or my house or, you know, the stuff that's very personal that... I thought was mine, um, and that's not really what's going on. Uh, it it's, it sounds like it's been um, 
a very badly worded rollout of some updated terms of service. Nilay Patel, who works over at The Verge, uh, who writes for them and is also a lawyer, so he's really good at stories like this. I mean, he had a whole breakdown of exactly what the terms of service mean. And he said, in essence, basically, it's just a more carefully worded version of the terms of service that we've all been dealing with this whole time. It's really no reason to to be alarmed. But, you know, Amber Leo, uh, he he was extremely alarmed. You know, he's talking about, oh, I don't want to use Inst- Instagram anymore. This just feels really wrong to me because even if they always had the capability to allow advertisers um, to use our photos as a way to promote a brand, this is sort of signaling that they're intending to, or mm-hmm. else they wouldn't even bother updating the terms of service. What do you What do you make of all this? Well, I think you're right. I think, I think it is a lot more about that intention. And obviously with the Facebook connection, I think there's a lot of people out there who don't trust Facebook as far as Facebook having ownership of your content in terms of posting photos and other things there. So I think uh, a, a lot of people were concerned. You know, I saw people, uh, you know, journalists like Anderson Cooper from CNN saying he was really worried and perhaps he would quit uh, Instagram. So there were a lot of people who are really well versed, I think, in a lot of the social services who were still afraid of what Instagram might be able to do with their content. I mean, it seems that as far as what I've read over the past couple of days is that they have no plans to do that, or at least they're trying to convey that message to people. But I think there's a real lesson here for everybody in the social media space. When you have a service like this that's so popular, you have to use really clear language in your term terms of service because people are reading that, you know, they're sharing that and they get nervous, and I think they should get nervous. You know, I know uh, our friend Kevin Rose had posted on uh, Twitter that, hey, you know, Instagram has to figure out some way to make money, and they're hosting your stuff for free, and so we have to be a little more accepting of uh, um, what they put out there. But I think at the end of the day, people just are becoming more concerned, and I think more knowledgeable about their their information and their ownership of that. And I, I think that's a good thing, to be honest. You put pressure on these companies because I don't know about you, Sarah, but at the end of the day, I think there are people who would pay for Instagram if they had to pay a small fee, a monthly fee to not have any ads and not worry about their content. I think people love the service that much. I agree. I I, I know that there were a lot of, um, there, there was a lot of talk about, well, now it must be time to go back to Flickr. You know, Flickr has a new iPhone app, actually. It's really nice. Uh, but uh, it's, it's sort of turned into, well, Instagram is you know, the wrong place to be. Now what do we all do? And, and it turns into, well, yeah, Instagram is a free service. And clearly the, the, the company was started to become a successful company. I mean, it's, it, you know, it just doesn't work that way um, where, the, you know, there's something that's, that's made and it's always free and the users benefit and everybody's happy and the company doesn't get anything. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. You know, they got to they got to host all our photos. They got to pay for servers. You know, it's this is complicated stuff and they have a ton of users. So, yeah, I mean, does it get to a point where to compare it to Flickr, you've got a uh, you know, free Flickr service and then there's Flickr Pro, which I actually just renewed recently, uh, not really because I was like leaving Instagram or anything, but it just kind of got me thinking, hey, you know, I should actually. And the app's great, like you said. Yeah, it, 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 re- it really is good. And so and Flickr Pro gives you more uh, storage and functionality than the free version does. And Flickr has always said, hey, you know, you own your photos. Um, that's sort of just the end of that. Uh, and hey, they could change their terms of service anytime too. I mean, they're owned by Yahoo, and Yahoo's also in the business of making as much money as possible. So, so yeah, Amber, I, I'm with you. I think I think this is um, a really good example of people panicking, and then a situation getting out of control. What it did force Instagram to do was speak up right away. I mean, Kevin mm. Systrom had a blog post um, that he posted, I mean, halfway into the first day of, of, of kind of the, the mania saying, hold, uh, okay, listen, first of all, some of you people are just getting this wrong, but even so, clearly we need to take out some of the wording that's freaking people out because we're not in the business of trying to drive you away and having you close your accounts. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, uh, just to have a little fun with this, uh, my co-host on Command and Laura, who listens to The Social Hour all the time, she had sent me a link to this uh, Twitter account, the Instagram TOS or Terms of Service. And uh, this is just a fun little account uh, uh, using a lot of different humor. One of the recent tweets on December 18th says, so we're cool, right? You still love me? Please remember the good old days, filters and stuff. And then it says brunch exclamation mark. So (laughs) you can see they're trying to have some fun here uh, with what's what's gone on and I think, you know, lighten up the situation a little bit because uh, as much as I care a ton about uh, my content that I post on the web, I think people did overreact. 
somewhat. So uh, that's a fun Twitter account if you want to check it out. That is really good. I love it. I love it. That's funny. Instagram TOS on Twitter. I wish that there was some place, you know, because the, the parody accounts, they have such a short shelf life, right? Oh, they do. They're, they're great in, you know, times of, uh, of crisis and, you know, when there's you know, some sort of a meme that you can piggyback off of. And it's like, I want all the parody accounts to go into some parody account receptacle. Maybe what I should do is I should just make a Twitter list and, and be proactive <laughs> and do it myself. That's actually a really good idea. All the parody accounts and then, you know, you can check back with them every so often. There's always so many, though, Sarah. There is. So it turns out um, that uh, Google had uh, acquired uh, Mebo uh, some time ago. And Amber, I don't know how familiar you are with Mebo. I've, I've only ever seen Mebo as sort of that little bar that shows up at the bottom of certain websites and kind of just looks annoying. Um, but uh, uh, Google had acquired Mebo, and no one really knew what Google was going to do with it. However, um, a post on thenextweb.com um, has a screenshot. If you scroll down a little bit, Alex, you'll see it there. It was a, um, a, a post on Google Plus that showed the Mebo bar in action. Um, the Mebo bar, by the way, I mean, I'm not the only uh, the person who, who didn't think much of the Mebo bar just because it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it takes up space. On, mm. on, on the bottom of your page and, and just kind of distracts you. Um, but it was a good way for advertisers to uh, be tracking engagement and that sort of thing. Obviously, that's something that, that Google's interested in. We, you know, Amber, you and I aren't the hugest Google Plus users, but do you think that for those who are, this is going to be a setback? Google Plus is pretty nice and clean as it is. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's going to be a setback. At least my feeling about people who are using Google Plus, the really active users, is that they love it so much. I mean, I think they're very loyal to that platform. So I don't think this is going to be a huge issue for them. So um, I, like I said, uh, I just like you, I'm not uh, as familiar with Mebo, but um, I don't. I don't think there's a huge drawback here. I think uh, um, I, I think there'll be some acceptance in the Google Plus community. Hopefully, I think they're willing to try new things, maybe to get more people. I don't know. Yeah, the, uh, Google Plus also um, uh, released, uh, it, you know, in the vein of what's new at Google Plus, I released some stuff, Google Plus communities, um, that they also have uh, some stats. 500 million registered users, over 500 million registered users. Um, and Google says of those 500 million registered users, 235 million actively are using features. So they're, you know, they're, they're plus one in things or, 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 or they're, well, see, this, this also includes Gmail. So it's sort of like, well, okay, I guess you could say that you're logged. In. Yeah, it's, I mean, I use Gmail a million times a day and I'm in my Google plus account sometimes, um, but certainly a, a small fraction of that. So so Google has some, has some very impressive numbers, but if you're counting Gmail, I think that that's a little bit skewed. You're not necessarily using Google Plus as a social network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, now, Sarah, uh, speaking of social, of course, like we always do on the show, this is a partic of particular interest uh, to me and, and probably to you, Sarah, since you worked in the TV industry for a while. The fact that uh, Nielsen and Twitter have just come together to establish social TV ratings. So uh, this has been uh, something that I think people have been thinking about for a really long time because so many people rely on talking about social or talking about television via social uh, media sites when they're watching TV. So now something to actually measure all of that chatter. So uh, um, it, ma it makes perfect sense to me. I think uh, being able to measure that is such a great thing. And I've always been a little bit skeptical of Nielsen TV ratings as far as how they do them. And I think we had a conversation in San Francisco about this. Oh, yeah. I mean, Nielsen ratings are, I mean, they, they are such a, it's, it's sort of baffling that that's still the way that we're actually tracking who's watching shows because... I mean, it's complicated. You know, we don't have to get into all that Nielsen stuff, but it's just, it is really not a very accurate um, uh, sample size, um, the way that Nielsen works, but that's the way that it's always been done. And I think it is really interesting that, especially uh, this year has been a very interesting year for things like spikes in ratings and... Um, take the U.S. presidential elections. Is always just that's a, that's an easy example because so many people were watching debates, for example, and talking about it on Twitter. And so you see, Twitter will 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 roll out these statistics like, oh, we had you know eight million 
tweets per second. I'm making that up. When, you know, the, the Obama-Romney, you know, speech or, or debate number two type of a thing. And it's that sort of like, okay, well, that's interesting, but what do we do with that? What, what can we make out of these sorts of statistics that Twitter's like, people are clearly watching and they're talking about it and they're engaged. And I mean, this is, this is the best proof that you have. It's very smart um, for Nielsen to, to sort of piggyback on all this data because what else is it besides kind of a cool novelty? Hey, Twitter hit a milestone, that kind of thing. This can mm-hmm. actually really, really help um, the people who are in the business of knowing what we're all doing and what we're all watching um, know specifically not only what we're watching, but what we think about it. You know, are we excited? Are we sad? Are we, you know, watching with a group of friends? Yeah, you know, all of that is, is, is really valuable. I think this is really going to change the television game, too, for many people who are producing TV who maybe uh, haven't really uh, thought much about what's happening in the social media space as far as conversations. And uh, I was reading today, I think it's Amazon who is uh, putting out uh, or producing a few different pilots, the comedy pilots, that uh, an audience online will be able to uh, submit what they think of each of these shows. And the show that gets the most uh, feedback in a positive way will be the show that actually will end up uh, being produced. So we see... I think how television programming is going and I think that the social experience is becoming such a big part of that. So right now shows that maybe, uh, you know, m- maybe a lot of people watch or they think a lot of people watch, maybe those shows won't be around anymore because the social media experience will be so important. Because I'm thinking of shows in the past, Sarah, that have been canceled and yet online they have this huge following. You know, you can imagine that uh, these ratings will skew uh, the audience, what the audience thinks a little bit in a, in a positive way, I think. Yeah, I, I yeah. Anything to to get sort of more accuracy is is good for us, and it, and it's good for the for the people who uh, who look at these numbers and 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 continue shows or cancel them based on these numbers. All right, let's move on to a little Facebook news. Facebook nearby is uh, it's 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 live, um, and it was a sort of a slow rollout. But this is. Uh, a Foursquare competitor, really. Um, it's sort of a, you know, you could say that Foursquare is a, already a Yelp competitor. Um, but this is Facebook's way of saying, okay, well, you can already check into a location on Facebook. You've had the, the, the ability to do that for a long time. I remember back in the day when Facebook rolled that out, everyone said, well, Foursquare is dead because Facebook has all the users. And now that you can just check in on Facebook, who would want to use anything else? Well, Foursquare certainly isn't dead. And Foursquare has sort of evolved as a company that you can still check into places you know, and, and see where your friends are. But it's a lot more of a discovery tool. Um, in fact, the latest update um, has really, you know, made made big changes to that. Where if you hit the explore button um, when you're at, when you're out and about, you get all sorts of recommendations um, based on what's nearby, tips that people have left about a cool cafe or you know, you know, the best table at a library, and you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, some of that would be from friends. Some of that would be from strangers. Looks like Facebook, uh, because they love doing this, has has replicated that functionality and they'd like you to do the same thing on Facebook. So instead of if you were just, um, you know, at a, at a particular location um, or you want to check in somewhere, uh, it, previously Facebook would geolocate you and then give you a list of places that you might be. You know, you look like you're on 140 Keller Street or you at the Twitbrick House, that's a venue, that sort of thing. And, and now it'll be more of a, I would have the option to do that, but I'd also see different places rise up in the list depending on things that my friends liked, places that maybe they were. It's all kind of the influence of likes and activities from people that I'm connected to on Facebook. So a little bit more of like, here's an intelligent suggestion of a place you might want to be or something that you might want to do based on where you are. I I, I like this. I do too, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as you know, I've mentioned this before, but I'm not one who checks in all the time. And so the the idea of doing that on Facebook never overly appealed to me, but I could see using this. And just based on the review on TechCrunch, it seems like it works pretty well. Obviously, they're going to be getting more information over time, but having that contextual information of wherever I am at any point, I think is really helpful if I'm in a new town or a new city and uh, it recommends things based on what it sees that I'm posting on uh, Facebook and what my friends are posting. I think the information is really valuable. So it makes a 
lot of sense. It reminds me a little bit, although I know it's somewhat different, but I know Google has a uh, field trip app that uh, does similar things, but it also uses augmented reality in an interesting way. But uh, I think these services are really exciting. Just being able to get kind of a layer of information around your geographic location that's useful with recommendations and all those other things. Yeah, I, 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 I was just traveling recently and I was out of the country and um, I was I was in Paris, which is obviously a big city, lots of stuff to do, and I'm certainly no expert. And I was using uh, the Foursquare Explorer uh, uh, feature all the time. It wasn't always the be- I mean, it didn't always give me all of the information I wanted. You know, sometimes I'd get a recommendation and I'd be like, eh, I just, I, that doesn't seem like a place that I would like. So it's not perfect, but... That's it's very, very helpful, uh, you know, to get suggestions, especially when you're kind of just trying to get over the feeling of being overwhelmed or, or, or having too many choices. Facebook's great because, again, it just has so much data on the things not only that I like and I do, but my friends. And I'm obviously likely to want to do the same kinds of things that my friends want to do or maybe they've left a tip or that sort of thing. I think what remains to be seen is this is probably just a great feature for Facebook to have. You know, why not? Why not offer this? But will it take any users from Foursquare? I don't really feel like Foursquare took much of a dent from Facebook rolling out location uh, services. Uh, So I don't know. I I think maybe it's just sort of a lot of companies realize that we want this. So they're all offering similar stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think this is just the future of social networks to be able to have this type of information built in there. So I don't think it's going to take a a ton of of, uh, users away from Foursquare at all. I think instead what it will do with people like me who maybe don't use Foursquare all the time, but use Facebook is that it will attract us to be able to use a service like that. And then maybe eventually we'll start checking in. So I think that's how they'll be able to capture a larger audience by people who are already existing Facebook users. It's interesting how there are the there are the people who and I think I'm kind of one of these people it's like I like to use Foursquare for my check-ins and Facebook uh-huh. for my messaging and you know certain updates and then you know there's another like photo site that I use for this or that. It's like I could do all of those things with Facebook. And obviously Facebook wants to be just the the network that does it all. And that's great because it you know, does a lot of your work for you. And then some people like to compartmentalize. But don't you think, Sarah... I kind of think that people like to, ha- a lot of people like to have different communities. And I think that's one of the things that attracts me about everything from Path to Instagram to Twitter to Facebook. I, as much as there's overlap between people that I know that are on multiple networks in, in terms of the ones I've just mentioned, but I think there's also a different feel in a different community all the time. And I would see or imagine it's the same thing with Foursquare, it's just a different experience, different community. And it's nice to have that separation. So I'm with you on uh, um, compartmentalizing all of this. Yeah, me too. I I I just don't want to put put it all in one network. You know? No, Facebook could be much. gone tomorrow. It's like eating a peanut butter and jam sandwich every single day, Sarah. You got to mix it up. <laughs> got to mix it up. Can't have the same old friends, the same old community no. every day. Oh, yeah. we'd want it. Hey, quick we'd reminder that. Uh, that we uh, we are recording uh, this episode of the Social Hour at a special time, a little bit ahead of time, so we can take a little bit of time off for our. Christmas week when this episode will air. But normally we do uh, record the show live on Fridays, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, right here at twit.tv. Thanks to everybody who joins us live. It's fun to have you. I'm always watching chat to make sure that you keep us honest and 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 and, and chime in with, with feedback and suggestions on the topics that we're talking about. Um, but if you can't watch live, not a problem. You just go to twit.tv slash TSH. That's where you can keep up on each and every episode of this fabulous show. We have show notes in, uh, in our individual episodes. So if you kind of you know, want to look, look into one of the stories that Amber talked about or, 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 or revisit something that, that, that we showed off, it's all there. We make sure that it's as easy as possible for you to keep up on the show. And you can subscribe to the show too, which is really the easiest way because then you just get the show delivered to you as soon as we release it. As soon as it gets encoded and pushed out to the internet, you get it and you download it. We don't even have to download it. And then, and then you watch it however, however you want to watch it. I watch it via my Apple TV, but that's just one of <laughs> many, many ways that you can enjoy our fine programming here. All right, Amber, before we get to some of our tips and spotlights and even viewer feedback, let's take a moment to thank SAP for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. It's such a, 
it's such a good little match. And, you know, Amber and I are actually going to be on an SAP uh, podcast in, uh, is it two weeks from today? I think January 2nd. I'm not sure if it's live yeah. or not, but I think it's January 2nd, if yeah. I'm right. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a social media business show that SAP uh, puts together. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. I'll remind you guys when it gets a little bit closer um, to the show and, and tweet out the links. But SAP is, is, is just a, a perfect partner for us because it's all about companies engaging with their customers and their users via social media. I mean, that is a huge issue for a lot of companies. When you're big enough, you're going to get a lot of feedback and you get people talking about you and you have to stay on top of that. Are people talking about you on Facebook or are they tweeting, you know, links or or bad experiences, good experiences? Are they blogging about your company? You have to make sure that you're listening and uh, and, and are able to um, able to react. So SAP has a little fantastic service called Social Media Solutions that does exactly that. This is for corporations and enterprise that helps you listen to your users. So uh, you can get reports on conversations, relevant terms, so you can make sure that you, there are certain terms that are flagged and you always you always get uh, when somebody um, has those terms uh, online and, and, and patterns and, and, and you, can, you can even follow your competitors that's that's important too, especially you know if you're big business, you got to know what the other guys are doing, and, and are people more excited about that? Uh, it gives you a sense of the intensity of of of, of anger. You know, if, if somebody's really angry about something, and it's like this is a really good person to reach out to, give a little customer service to. All of that is all of that is built in. Also helps you identify customers who are ready to buy. If you're in the business of selling customer stuff, any good salesperson knows that there are. There are some there are some key traits of somebody who is ready to buy, and that's the point where you be as helpful as possible. SAP uses something called natural language processing. This is the kind of stuff that you know allows robots basically to understand emotion. You know, so if somebody says something, there's sort of like a well, what is, is it? Sarcasm? Are they happy? Are they not happy? That all needs to be taken into consideration. Then, of course, you've listened, you've got all your information, and then you have to engage. So SAP um, improves customer support because you can set rules about who's getting what message. If you've got a team of people, you know, everybody might be in charge of something. So you know, I might not be in charge of the tech support part of someone's complaint, but, but I know who is, and it shouldn't even go through me. It should, just, it should go through the, the tech support person. So it's, it's intelligent message routing, you can think of it that way. Somebody uh, tweets about... Uh, some sort of social media question, for example, and you're the social media person, then you, you, know, you know to get right back to them. Social media solutions from SAP is accurate, uh, real time, which is obviously very important in this day and age, understanding of brands' social media performance. How are you doing? That's what social media solutions from SAP wants to let you know. So if you manage social media presence, and many of you do, uh, you write us all the time for a large regional or a national enterprise. You should definitely get in touch with SAP. How do you do that, you say? SAP.com slash twit. Easy as pie. You can learn a lot more about social media solutions and if it is the answer for your company to get on top of that social media engagement. Okay, Amber, let's move on to speaking of social media marketing. Uh, we've yeah. got, we've got uh, some interesting numbers. Yeah, this is interesting for people who are listening in who manage some type of social media strategy or campaign for a company. You'll be happy to hear this particular stat. This was a survey that was done. There were thousands of people in Canada and the U.S. who were surveyed uh, in April, May of this year. And based on the results, uh, 45% of people on social networks say they have interacted with a brand through social media. I thought that was pretty significant. And definitely we've seen a, a pretty good rise here in terms of the number of people who are going out and like brands pages on Facebook and and following brands on Twitter. The interesting thing I think about this study in the next sentence on this Mashable article where they talk about how just 7% say that they followed a brand on Twitter. Twitter. Uh, and 7% say they've posted feedback on a company's social networking profile. So there's not a ton of information here, Sarah, but at first glance, what I was thinking about is that um, for many brands, it seems like a lot of people would prefer to interact with them maybe on Facebook as far as having conversations. You know, Twitter seems in some ways... T- 
for me to just be more informational in terms of the brands that I follow. And I don't interact as much as I would maybe on a Facebook page. Um, also in this study, they talked a little bit about how users are actually buying from different brands across social media sites. And the numbers are quite low. It's going to take a while for those numbers to rise again. But uh, uh, I think pretty good news for people who are in the internet marketing space. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't interact with many brands on social media at all, Amber. I, I do. So there are certain brands that I'm certainly following on Facebook. But then Facebook, because it wants so badly uh, you know, for, for the, the promoted ads in our news feed to, to, to work and, and make advertisers happy, I see so many brands that my friends have liked at the top of my news feed, you know, and I'm constantly hiding them. And then once I've hidden it forever, then it's never going to show up. And I don't know. It's, it's complicated. It's definitely complicated. But I do feel like Twitter is, it's certainly not my number one place to follow a brand. But there is, there is, a, a, there is a place for it. And, and mm. I think that Facebook pages are probably one of the best examples of a good place. Because you really can have conversations and multimedia and stay on top of it. And, and we, we've all seen the Facebook pages where you go, well, that's definitely a brand, but this is very well done, you know, and they're obviously yeah. keeping it up to date and, and it feels alive. Yeah, you can just do too much, so much more. And I think um, I think also we have to talk about the definition of the term brand. Because when we say brand, sometimes you're thinking of those really large companies, maybe like Amazon or The Gap or whatever they might be. But I think some of the brands that I follow are actually smaller local businesses. And I do pay attention to what they're doing online. I follow them on Twitter, you know, the tea shop down the street from my house, the local pub, all of these businesses, I, I do consider them to be brands. And I think in the local business market, I think that's very exciting because I think we have more of a kind of a high touch experience with uh, individuals in a community and those brands that uh, perhaps they follow or a friend on Facebook. So some exciting opportunities there for more of a relationship. So uh, I think that's a different way or different approach. I think that a lot of people perhaps are taking. Absolutely. Uh, We've got a spotlight of the week. I I honestly just heard about this uh, earlier today. Kitchenly, so it's kitchen.ly, um, and it has been called the Airbnb for restaurants. So you go, <laughs> okay, well, okay. Uh, what? What does it mean? So if you look at, um, if you just on the homepage there that we're looking at, um, it says, who is Kitchenly for? Well, college students, for students that want to find a home cooked meal at school or want to make some cash on the side, for foodies that love to cook and want to share their favorite recipes with the world, for private chefs that want to ply their trade, get feedback, make some money doing it, for restaurants that want to fill in empty reservations or promote a specialty dish. Okay, I kind of love this. That sounds pretty cool. Okay, so if I just search for, you know, I'll search for uh, a zip code in San Francisco. Sorry, but it looks like there are no hosts here. Well, that's disappointing. (laughs) I mean, geez. No kitchen like you, Sarah. Yeah. Well, all right. Maybe another zip code. (laughs) No. Well, shoot. I mean, how can there not be any in two different zip codes in San Francisco? It's pretty new, though, right? Yeah, is it possible to start any listings? Yeah, or not a not 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 a lot of them. Yeah, it's pro- there's probably um, several more in in the area where it came from. Let's see where let's see where, let's see where they're based out of um, in the about area. Mm. So anything? All right, no, no, I don't know. no, I don't, I don't actually see where they're or they're at least not telling us uh, where they're based. It probably doesn't matter so much. I don't know. I I I, I love the idea of. A, um, a restaurant, a particularly restaurant just because reservations can be such a hassle, uh, you know, and I, and I love little uh, technical reservation systems that help uh, get you in somewhere, you know, that might be busy or, or, or manage that. In fact, I just used Open Table last night and it was great. You know, we walk right in at 730 and they're expecting us. Um, but I don't know how much, I mean, would you go... Uh, dine with a private chef because you had seen them on Kitchenly. I mean, there's at so their, much... Is it at their house? This is what I'm confused about. Well, I think it depends. I think it depends. You know, a restaurant I could say... I go to their house. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's it's sort of like... I mean, it's it's excess inventory, right? I mean, that's that's all this is. I mean, you could... It's the same thing that an airline does, uh, you know, or, or a hotel... This is sort of like, hey, there's food that I could sell to you. Um, are you interested? 
this is sort of like and if you use the Airbnb comparison, it's a uh, it's it's a place that that is a little bit more personal that belongs to somebody. Uh, in this case, though, it's it's actually food. I I don't know. Um, it, it, it's it's interesting. You almost think like there could be health concerns. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think because so. it's like with Airbnb, if somebody has, and I actually just stayed in Airbnb in, in Paris last week, and there were a lot of things I liked about it, but there were a few things that I didn't like about it. You know, and I can give feedback, and the host gets that, and Airbnb understands, you know, what was good and bad about my stay. And that sort of, that was kind of just like a roof over my head type of a thing. Food is a little bit different, and people are so particular about that sort of thing. I like the idea. I'm just not sure how much it's going to catch on, and, and clearly it's brand new or, or not catching on at all. <laughs> well, first they need some cooks who are going to be hosts, and then yeah. uh, maybe it will catch on a little bit. I don't know. Um, it, it seems like a good idea, and I think that's because I like the way it's described as Airbnb for restaurants, and that's so catchy and uh, kind of sexy right now in the social media world because everybody loves Airbnb. But uh, from a practical standpoint, I just I don't see me as being someone who would use that. I don't know if there's anyone listening or watching who would use it. If they think that's interesting, please let us know because uh, maybe Sarah and I pardon the pun, are totally out to lunch and uh, we're missing something here. Yeah. Well, I've typed Maybe. in San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, and Toronto, and there are Nothing. no kitchens. No kitchens at all. So maybe this is just some grand ruse. Sarah, where did you find the service? Who knows where I find anything? On Twitter, I think. Somebody said something about <laughs> it. I mean, I, I'm not exactly sure. It was... It's hilarious. It, it was, you know, in my list of things where I go, oh, this is cool. We'll show it off live on the social hour. <laughs> it's not much to see. It's more of a concept. Too funny. Yeah. All right. Well, um, Sarah, I'm just going to back up in our rundown, just uh, one uh, line back to our social tip. And uh, this might be a little bit more useful, uh, especially for people who use Google+. Plus. And for anyone who uses Blogger, uh, I used to use Blogger years and years ago. I do not use it at all anymore. But I know there are still people who, who depend on it and who use it on a regular basis to write blog posts. Well, now there is stronger Google Plus integration into Blogger so that you can mention other users who are on Google Plus in your blog post. So a uh, really simple thing to do once you're in the Blogger uh, tool is to uh, simply add the plus sign and the user's name and then someone can link directly out to them. Um, and have, it's just a tighter way to integrate between the two services. I, I kind of wanted to mention this as a social tip, not that I'm going to use it necessarily, but uh, we're seeing more and more of this, right, Sarah, with Google Plus where they're trying to integrate in many different ways. So I think we have no choice but to start using Google Plus again. Yes, I agree. Well, they're, they, they are really, really clever about making sure that it's easy to, to jump back. And that's good. Exactly. It, it, that's good. And obviously, it's smart. It, yeah, if, you're, if, if, it, if it's on Blogger, it makes perfect sense. Um, I've always, I still sort of wonder, you know, is Blogger going away? Obviously, there are a lot of people uh, who, who still use Blogger as a, as a blogging platform. And anytime you see a blog spot, um, uh, um, domain, but 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 you can use your own domain as well and just have it hosted there. But it always has. It's felt for a long time as it's been sort of abandoned. It's there. It's fine, but it's not sort of new and exciting. And Google wouldn't Google wouldn't keep it around. I mean, they'd fold it into Google Plus unless they felt that it was important enough to have you know as a standalone blogging platform. So. It's kind of nice to see whenever I see something that gets updated on Blogger, I kind of go like, oh, because Blogger was one of the first places that anybody could make a blog, you know, back in I the know. early days of blogs. So, so it's, it's, yep. kind of, it's kind of a dinosaur that's now getting a little, a little Google Plus treatment. So I feel like we're going retro on the social hour. You know, we're talking about Flickr and Blogger. I mean, how many years has it been? We've talked about MySpace over the past few weeks, and it's I like know. we're going back to the past. These uh, services are trying to uh, have new life and have a, a, a second chance at uh, uh, gaining more popularity. Kind of interesting. Yeah, I, the Flickr thing is is kind of great. I mean, I've... Amber, I have always loved Flickr. I, I really mm -hmm. don't use Flickr all that often. But what I have done is, for the most part, I mean, I'm sure there are a few exceptions, but anytime I post a picture on Instagram, I just cross post it to Flickr because I figure, well, why not? I mean, I'm taking a picture. I might sure. as well just at least have it in Flickr somewhere. So when a lot of people were complaining about you know, this whole Instagram thing, I thought to myself, well, you know, I really haven't been using my point and shoot because I'm shooting, you know, a bunch of iPhone pictures. And now, of course, they're cropped and they have Instagram filters on them. But I like the pictures and I still feel like I've been active on Flickr. I'm just usually not going to the site, looking at my stats, commenting, commenting on other people's photos. 
And I love the idea of a Flickr comeback story. I really do because it's there's, <laughs> there's there's never been anything wrong with Flickr. I you know I didn't no. I didn't like the mobile app. Uh, the new mobile app is really really nice. They it's just, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, they're just late to the game, which is unfortunate. But I I it's one of those. It's kind of like the old Web 2.0 companies. That which is funny even to say that, but I, I, Flickr was one of the best. So it'd be really nice to see it flourish again. Well, they're trying to reinvent themselves, right? We've seen this with Dig. We've seen it with uh, Delicious in, in some sense uh, over the years. But uh, it's just like the ones that are trying to stay around have to reinvent themselves completely, hope that audiences stick with them. And we're just watching to see if they're going to survive or not. I do think that out of all of the services that we've mentioned, I think Flickr um, it has the best chance of being part of a lot of people's lives again as far as them using on a regular basis just because of their mobile strategy. I mean, we can't deny how much people depend on phones for taking pictures and saving those pictures. So um, I I think that's going to be, you know, 2013. I think they'll have a pretty good year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Another service that I uh, was, I don't know, I I was, I was walking through the internet and I found it somewhere is a, I know actually this is, um, this was an email that we got from uh, a a service called Rebutter, I guess is how you would pronounce it. It's R-B-U-T-R dot com. Um, talk about a Web 2.0 name if I ever heard one. And what this is, is a service. Right now, it's just a Chrome plugin, uh, if you use the Chrome browser. A service that alerts you to articles that may be a rebuttal to another article. So, you know, if, ah. you, if you're reading some sort of an opinion piece on Instagram, you know, the whole Instagram terms of service are, are, are evil and you should shut down your, your account immediately might be one side of the story. Well, there might be a really interesting other side of the story. And of course, in that case, there, there were many on both sides. There, there, were, there were all sorts of articles. But sometimes, you know, you read an opinion piece and it's like, Okay, that's you know that's 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 opinionated, and you might think, well, I'm very swayed by 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 the points that this person made, and it's very helpful to have a little handy plugin that helps you jump over to a related article that is a rebuttal. And the idea behind the the service, which is still in beta, is that uh, it would be not only able to jump you back and forth, but to discern you know what's the source and then what's the what's the rebuttal, the follow up. And that's pretty cool. I, I went ahead that's and very- installed it, and you know, I'm, I've kind of, I've kind of trying to get rebuttals um, based on uh, this is stuff that's not really all that controversial. Uh, you know, if I if I go ahead and click my my rebuttal here, this is this is a submit a request to the to the re- rebutter community to find rebuttals to this page. So what this is is it's a it's a sort of a joint effort you know there's 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 crowdsourcing information so i could help direct people to a rebuttal page or i could uh get that information you know if, if i was a third party so it's, it's just kind of an kind of, kind of an interesting yeah idea. that's really cool it's funny i've just been reading the uh article on pointer.org about uh this particular plugin and uh it looks like they've been doing pretty well they uh recently won a, a prize for a top 10 startup that could change the face of news i think this could be really interesting in the news space and uh just gives people a different opinion on uh, whatever they're reading and uh you know a lot of what's out there on the internet of course is not necessarily true or accurate or factual so any Thing I think that tries to bring, bring people into bring the masses closer to uh, what's fact versus fiction is a great thing, and it seems like this does that. So uh, this is fun. I've never heard of this, Sarah. Yeah, it's neat. In fact, I'm looking at a list of they've they've got a recent rebuttals page, which sort of gives you an idea of okay, well, I, who's using this and, and how does it work well? Um, there is a Telegraph versus a Guardian post um, that has to do with well, violent crime and and and. And and sort of what to do about that in Europe. Um, there is oh here's here's that Instagram story. Instagram uh-huh. that, here's CNET News. This headline says Instagram says it now has the right to sell your photos. The Verge article, which was written by Neil I. Patel, who I mentioned earlier, um, headline is no Instagram can't sell your photos. What the new terms of service really mean, and so on. So these you know that's a very good example of something where you just get two sides of the story. And sometimes it's really helpful to read them both because you get the, you get things put more in perspective. 
Yeah, that's very cool. I love that. Um, okay, Sarah, another thing that uh, maybe isn't as uh, academic at all is uh, this particular meme that's been going around uh, the internet for a while. And uh, in fact, the story originally took place, the real part of the story took place in Toronto, my hometown. And uh, I'm not sure if you heard about the Ikea monkey. But this monkey oh, I, has become... Oh, I heard about it. All right. Oh, yes. A very famous monkey. So uh, there's a woman who lives in Toronto who, uh, believe it or not, owned a monkey, even though it's not legal to do so. And she took the monkey to Ikea. The monkey uh, got loose, was running around the Ikea with this weird sweater jacket thing on. I don't know. It has a particular name, but um, I'm not really following the fashion of the monkey so much. Uh, and uh, the story went everywhere. Well, I think what's even funnier are some of the memes that have been created. And in fact, uh, based on... On this uh, link that I've sent, there are like 30 different memes and images that have been created with the particular monkey front and center uh, as the star of uh, the Photoshop photos. So it's a, it's, a, it's a ton of fun if you need a great laugh. Oh, the little monkey with the little hat or with the, with the, with the, with the little... What is that? It, the I, jacket? Yeah, the jacket. I mean, it's he's so snug in there. What? Yeah. Oh, I, lo- I yeah, love he's the one very with the cat. <laughs> Oh, it's, oh it's too funny. I know. It's so all funny. the Photoshop pictures are absolutely hilarious. And uh, um, like I said, there's no shortage of them. I started seeing these within a couple of days. I think there are various Twitter accounts that have been dedicated to the Ikea monkey. Um, unfortunately, he's uh, um, the Ikea monkey is uh, right now, I think that he's uh, in, uh, I don't want to say in captivity, but it's being held at animal services, I think, in Toronto somewhere. Yes, and yeah, he's going I, back to his owner. I, yeah, I believe there's, there's some, there's some, uh, there's some some concern as to what exactly happened. <laughs> oh, Hannibal I know. Monkey. Poor little Hannibal. Um, oh gosh, that's great. Poor little IKEA monkey. Yeah, that was um that was it's the whole thing is I mean, I, I want the monkey to be safe, of course, but a little a yes. little uh, uh social network comic relief, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, the monkey is probably in good hands right now. And uh, even though his, quote, mom misses him, um, that uh, I think he, he's probably safe now. And, you know, he's not running around in Ikea. He could get hurt, right, Sarah? That could be a dangerous situation. Well, you know, I've always sort of thought that if you could figure out a way to hide in Ikea, you know, it's like when they're closing stuff down, you, I don't know, you hide under one of the beds where they can't see you. They must really sweep Ikea stores because you know that people want to spend the night in an Ikea. Or maybe they just have a lot of security guards after hours. I've never really thought of that before. Now you're really creeping me out, Sarah. That's a you good know point. What I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I want to know. It's like, it's sort, of, it's sort of like, you know, that movie Mannequin, right? You know, where they're all stuck in the mall overnight. Oh, yes. And then she comes to life. I, I've always sort of thought, you know, does anyone have a great story about uh, having spent the night in an Ikea? You could get some Swedish meatballs and... Snuggle up Ice in your cream, favorite bed. hot dogs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I'm sure all that stuff will just be open and available, right? If you could just if you could just make it past them turning off the lights. But that's just my little IKEA fantasy. <laughs> I want to remind everybody. There's still time, Sarah. There's yeah, still time. It's true. Yeah, I can just drive to Emeryville right now and and get comfortable and hope that they don't see me. They mu- they must pat down all the beds. There must be people who try to do that. Well, yeah. if, you, if you are one of them, please do write us. You can write us at the social hour at twit.tv. Don't have to write us about IKEA. You can write us about anything. Questions, comments, ideas, uh, cool stuff for us to talk about and, and test out and, and, and share with the rest of the community. You can leave us a voicemail, 2626-SOCIAL. So just type in 2626-SOCIAL. Got a couple of voicemails uh, this week. Um, try to keep them to 30 seconds or less. That way we can roll them into the show. Anything a little bit longer than that. And it's hard to it's hard to fit it into our flow. So do keep that in mind. And if you want to record a video, we would like that even more. Just record it, upload it somewhere, and then send us the link for where we can watch it. And thanks in advance. All right, Amber, we're coming to the super cool part of the show, which is <laughs> your rad or fad. But first, let's take a moment to thank... Ford for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. Okay, so we've talked in the past about really cool Ford technologies that is absolutely putting them sort of in the future of vehicles. And this, these these two features I'm about to talk about are are the best yet. And I know that you're going to say, Sarah, you say that every time, but no, I really do mean (laughs) it this time. So here we've got, we've got the Blind Spot Information System, BLIS, Bliss. 
and the active park assist. So blind spots, you know that feeling. You're on the freeway, and it's like there's that guy, you know, and he's sort of just, you can sort of feel, that, is there a car there? But you've got a blind spot. Some cars are even worse than others, and, and you can't see them that well. And it's important to know that they're there before you t turn into the lane and get yourself into an accident. I mean, that can be a real safety concern. What's great about Bliss technology is that it warns the driver of oncoming traffic. So if you've got, you know, if, there, if there's a blind spot going on or you're backing out of a parking space, you know, this just happened, this literally just happened to me the other day. Someone was backing out and they didn't see me and I kind of thought that they would and they almost, I mean, hit me, you know, they almost T-boned my car. So that is, those, are, those are areas that are, are, are of a lot of concern. And what Bliss will do is give you audio and visual cues. Oh, wait, there's somebody there. Don't move. You know, you've got, you've got, you, you're looking, you're, you've got the camera view. So you're actually seeing what's behind you. But there's also the audio cues as well. Because if you're, if you're distracted, bad things can happen. So Bliss technology is awesome with that. I mean, it's just, it's all about keeping you safe, right? You, you want to, you want to be on the road and doing your thing, but you want to be, you want to be safe and know who, what other drivers or objects are around you. Active Park Assist is even more mind-blowing. It uses sensors to identify a parallel parking space that your car can indeed fit in. You know, you've, you've driven up. I mean, I, I live in San Francisco, so parallel parking is just part of the deal. You've got to get used to it. And there are a lot of spaces that I've looked at and thought, I don't no, but I'm pretty desperate, so I'm going to give this a try. And then, of course, they're not big enough. So Active Park Assist will let you know, yeah, yeah, you can do this. Calculate what, what needs to happen, you know, at what angle you have to go in. And then it will park you for you. You don't have to do anything. The car parks itself, and you just sit there, and you go, woo, this is awesome. I didn't have to do this. And some people are really, really bad parallel parkers. Uh, so if you're one of those people, you know that you need this. And even if you're not, I mean, just, wouldn't it be nice not to have to do any of the work? I mean, you could do it, but why not just let the car do it? Because the car has got the whole angles and the math and, it, you know, there's no, there's no human to, to muck it up. All of this happens in 24 seconds. I know, it just keeps getting better and better. All the driver <laughs> uh, operates are the accelerator, the gear selector, and the brake pedal, right? So, of course, you could say, ah, brake, you know, this or that. But the car does everything else for you. It just gets you into those little tight spaces. Uh, Bliss with cross-traffic alert and active park assist. So those are the great things that I talked about. The two things I talked about are available in the 2013 Ford Fusion and the 2013 Ford Taurus. So two great cars that do great stuff. Um, as, as Leo uh, said on an earlier show today, it's, 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 it's like autonomous driving, you know, as, as close as we are going to get to something like that um, if we're in the near future. You can learn more about these technologies and other technologies that Ford is working hard on to bring to their vehicles and to all of us at Ford.com slash technology. And you know what you should do if this all sounds very interesting and, and we talk about Ford a lot on the social hour Go down to a Ford dealership and test drive one of these things. I mean, see how it feels. Uh, you, can, you can certainly get a sense of what Ford is doing online. But if you're interested, you know, get into one, one of the cars and, and try out some of the stuff and, and see if, uh, if it indeed is, is, is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I think you mm. will think that it is. And thanks to Ford for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. All right, Amber, it's rad or fad time. Mm -hmm. What you got? All right. Okay, so for this week's rad or fad, we have another Kickstarter campaign. There's always lots of fun stuff happening on Kickstarter. This is a little bit different, though. This is uh, something that's happening in the publishing space. And in fact, this particular campaign has earned more than $425,000 in the past month. It's amazing. Now, you may think this is a gadget or something else to do with technology. It really isn't. Uh, what it is, is it's a uh, choose-your-own-adventure. Uh, book, which has been created by a popular cartoonist, and it's based on Shakespeare's Hamlet. So, uh, a, a, I think a really fun way that someone has uh, gotten creative, creative with Hamlet, and uh, as you may know, Shakespeare's works are all in the public domain now, so no issue with him doing this. Uh, so, he's come up with this idea. His name is uh, Ryan North, and uh, it's an interactive story where you choose your own adventure and uh, you know participate in, I think, what many people uh, uh, probably read when they were in school and uh, be part of that action. I love it. This is so cool. I mean, I'm looking at the Kickstarter page right now 
over 14,000 backers. Amazing, um, huh? I mean, 12 hours to go by the time, unless you're watching this live, by the time you see this, the project will be over. But it was a $20,000 goal, $531,000 uh, well, it, it, and, and some change. I mean, talk about a successful Kickstarter project. This yeah. is really cool. I love this. It's so creative. Yeah. It's yeah. so creative. So uh, I think, you know, just based on our feedback right now, we have to give it a uh, big rad because uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, really fun way, I think, for someone to take something that uh, many people have read and uh, turn it into a more interesting story. Oh, my light just burnt out. Um, oh, but that's okay because we're at the end of the show. All of a sudden, I didn't lose power. Don't worry. No, it's great. It's, it's very, um, you, we've kind of got like a Shakespeare mood thing going yeah, on. Yeah, it's kind of a mood thing, you know. I've been doing a bunch of Skype video calls today, so it was bound to happen. Your light uh, had Christmas enough. Weekend. Look, it's like, yeah. it's like you have a really cool Instagram filter now. I know. It's, I'm all filtered, you're so very, it's awesome. You're very hipster. Yeah, it worked out very really well. Hipster. Uh, but yes, um, it, it, is the, it is the end of the show, so I guess it couldn't, it couldn't have come at a better time, really, for no, your, for your light to, have, to poop out. It's like, it's, like, it's like it's a big play, Sarah, and it's like lights out now, now that we've determined that that's rad. Okay, well, Chris, Chris <laughs> has jumped in and saved the day. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think this uh, Kickstarter campaign is awesome. I've never heard of anything like this. Uh, like you said, very creative, very original, and obviously a massive success. Yeah, and, and Hamlet too. I mean, Hamlet's, that's heavy stuff. It's kind of, kind mm-hmm. of fun to choose your own adventure. Um, so yeah, g- good on, what was the name of this? This uh, Ryan North. Ryan North. Yes, yeah. I, I guess he's fairly well known. You yeah, know, he's yeah. done work and um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like I, I would love to get one of these interactive storybooks and choose my own adventure. It would be fun. I studied like many people's Shakespeare in school and uh, it would be fun to participate in this. So uh, a very cool, be great gift idea for someone, I think. Very Someone fun. Yeah, very, love- very, um, very creative gift. So, you know, again, Kickstarter project, once it's over, then, it, you know, it's, there's usually a bit of time before anything uh, ships and, and, and you get uh, the, you're able to participate in the project or, or get the gadget or whatever it is. But um, it's something definitely one to watch. And of course, we'll have the direct link to the project in our show notes so that you can keep up with the creator as well. Yes, definitely. Well, Amber, so, we've come. Uh, rat. We've come. We've come. We've come to a rad. Yes, that's always a good way to end the show. Um, and it is it actually. Is. It is actually the end of the show. Uh, we've been. We've been doing this for about an hour exactly, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's. I feel like I haven't seen you in so long because. Because I was on vacation, and now you're in Florida, oh, I know. and then we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be gone next week, and it doesn't really matter for anybody who's 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 just subscribing to the show and watching it. But as far as as far as we go, we we feel a little bit jumbled as far as the schedule goes. So it was fun. Yes, it was tons of fun. And there's always so much happening, Sarah. So there's no shortage of ideas. And we try to keep it in an hour. And I have to say, so we're pretty good. We're yeah, almost. We are. I think, I think, I think time. we've hit the sweet spot as, as far as how much to put into the show so that we can keep it to an hour yes. and give everything enough time and not rush and, and not dwell on anything. And reminder, we are live uh, usually on Fridays, 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Our website is twit.tv slash tsh. And uh, you can find our show on iTunes, and and uh, if you if you have a creative way that you, you know you watch the show or 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 that, or that you participate with the show, just let us know. It's always nice to know where where you all come from and what you get out of the social hour, and what kinds of stories that we cover are the most interesting to you, and what you'd like to see more of. Because really, this show is because Amber and I just love the social space, but it's also for you because we wouldn't do it if you guys weren't enjoying yourself so thanks to everybody who watches each week until next week i'm sarah lane and just before i go sarah i know i'm throwing off for ending of the show but i just was looking at my twitter feed and it looks like just so uh, we don't appear to be uh, totally out of touch that instagram has formally changed its terms of service based on user feedback i just saw this go live on oh Mashable, my gosh, uh, no three kidding. minutes ago So just wanted to uh, include that. Uh, I don't know a lot more details than that, but uh, just saying they, including the fact in their terms of service that they won't be using user photos and ads. And uh, hopefully everybody is happy with this update. So uh, there's a new entry on their blog outlining the new, new terms of service. Well, there you have it. The beginning of the show started with Instagram terms of service and everybody getting upset. And we said, hey, things might change. Give us a break. And then by the end of the show, they already had. So <laughs> We're all a, safe again. It's a crazy space. In one hour, anything can change. Anything can happen. All right. And uh, I'm Amber MacArthur in Florida, and we will see you soon.